You guys seem so far away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much uh, for your, your time and your presentations. Um, at this point, we want to open it up for um, any questions that you might have for any and all of our panelists. Of course, I've got a few to key things off. There are two runners uh, in, uh, from staff in the audience. Uh, so if you just raise your hand and you want to ask a question to any one of us or all of us or whatever, we'd be happy to take uh, your questions. So with that, uh, while people are sort of gathering their thoughts and raising their hands imminently, um, I'm going to ask a question about um, measurement was sort of a theme for each one of your, your presentations. And so when we, we look at the concept of, of measurement, um, how can operators in particular, uh, where should they start with measuring, you know, because there's so many different things we already measure for benchmarking, and where does some sustainability aspects come in? So I'll let any one of you take that. I, I, for me, I think the, the best thing to do is just start with that baseline. What is it that you're gonna measure, uh, figuring it out? I think the UC, we've done a really good job of being able to identify what our baselines are as a group and, and comparing them with each other. Um, I think the one thing that I've learned about measurements is that we always seem to change it. Um, so it's like, make sure that you're measuring the same thing the second time. Uh, we seem to modify it a little bit and then the numbers don't match. Uh, but I think that's been one of my biggest challenges is that we're always modifying the metric and I'd rather, I, you know, we want to be consistent so that the numbers mean something. I'd just like to say that in agriculture, they know that that's a, they don't, if you ask a farmer what's his climate or his carbon imprint, only about 7% of the farmers could give you an answer to that question because it's not the language that they speak in. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to help them understand what it is that you need. And again, working through some of places like where you can leverage that question. Um, I also believe that uh, a lot of the things we're asking farmers to do are in production is going to decrease their efficiencies and it's going to decrease food production. So there's a balance there and we need to make sure that some of the things we're asking for that we understand the trade-offs. Yeah. The um, become is no surprise at my answer on measurement. I mean, I think I would encourage people to think of food waste as a critical control point that in the same way we measure for food safety. When you look at your garbage, it's an empirical representation of your inefficiency, and it's, a, and it's really a basket full of ideas. So I think if you measure that, that's a good one to add to the list. And specifically, the way we encourage people to think of it is waste as a percentage of what you bought. And we call that a food efficiency ratio. And keeping track of that over time, to Chris's point, being able to say, what's our food efficiency ratio week to week, month to month, allows people to really understand, are you becoming more efficient or not? And if there's a problem, it probably speaks to other issues upstream. What strategies do you have for drilling down on the issue? So we take, you know, whether it's, you know, I bought this many pounds of this particular commodity or I have this many pounds of that, that, that data only tells you something. And I think sometimes we're, it's great to have the data and we're all excited about it, but then we don't do the hard work, which is drilling down on that. What are, what are some strategies you recommend to people to really roll up your sleeves and get into the data a little bit to, to make improvements? For Andrew or Chris, any? I can start, I mean, I think, Smart goals are really powerful. So you've got to take, you know, there's this hierarchy of, of, of uh, data uh, and information and knowledge. And, you know, you start with data, you organize it into information, and then you try to actually make it knowledge, right, as you, as you refine it. And one of the, I think, most proven ways of moving something from unorganized into organized action is to set a goal and something that's smart, specific and measurable, et cetera. So if you can say, wow, I see I have a problem in this area and you decide you're gonna work on that one thing, it's soup, you're gonna work on it for a week, knock it down, you have the ability to really suddenly in, uh, stimulate a lot of imaginative discussion around that one topic and that focus yields outcomes. I, the one thing I would, with us just starting the lean path process, I think one of the things that we've recognized is the staff that are entering the information have kind of decided that overproduction is the one to use. So they just put overproduction on everything. <laughs> and you have to question them on like, why did you select overproduction? There's other options. Are we sure it wasn't something else? So I think really being analytical about the data to identify what it is you want to change and then really questioning it and speaking to your staff, speaking to our sous chef or to our, our, you know, our lead cooks and saying, what's going on? Why are we seeing this waste? and getting them to be responsible for it. Because in the end, those are the people who are actively entering the data into our system. So we want them to be comfortable and for them to feel safe that they can report it. Because I think that is one of the challenges with staff. They're, that cook doesn't want to admit, I overproduced. 
they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble for it. So that was one of the conversations we had to have with staff initially was, this isn't to get anybody in trouble. We're trying to do the right thing, and we're trying to find a way to, to cut the food waste that we have. I'd like to follow up on that, Chris. So how did you, you know, what are the things that you and your team have done to create that culture uh, of, of safety? You know, I think we all have to do that for any type of error, you know, um, that, that we want to know about it first and foremost, and then take whatever steps we can do. So what are, what are some tips that you, know, you could share with people to say that you, on, on creating that culture to, you know, do the right thing, but also, you know, get incentivized a little bit to, to do some of this stuff? Yeah, I, th I think one of the challenges that I've had with that is that um, I try to come from the top down and share with them, that, look, I just want to make improvements. I want to find a way for us to do things better. Um, I, when I first started, uh, one of the first conversations I had with my entire team was, I'm coming in here to make changes because things aren't working the way they're supposed to. If you don't like changes, you're probably not going to like working for me. And so the people who've been there for six years with me have kind of figured out, hey, we're doing things, we're doing things the right way. So I think that culture of trusting leadership, that we're not there to get them in trouble, we're there to make the job right, to hopefully they come to work and enjoy themselves and they do their job correctly. So I think it's kind of just in, encouraging them to tell us the right things and, and not backing up on your word. If somebody tells me they overproduced because they read four instead of five or, or misordered, then that's something you want to say, hey, let's just try to be better at it the next time. I have a question in the back. Thank you very much. Hey, um, Patty, you talked about the evolving science of um, how we look at eggs for cholesterol, whatever. What are some examples that you can give in the climate change science that's evolving for farmers? So I would say that there's a lot of conflicting research out there right now on how they are looking at that, what they're measuring, what they're using uh, on, on the metrics. Um, so, but some of the evolving research is, um, you know, where you're at in the world. I guess that's what probably the biggest aha for me has been. So when we roll these numbers up globally, those numbers look horrific, but if you look at how, at least on, and it's no secret, I work in beef cattle production. So, sorry, Dan. But, um, Why are you apologizing to me? Know, but anyway, <laughs> you are from the Midwest. But anyway, so in the United States, we are very, very efficient with those. If you look at the top country in the world that has cattle is India. Well, in India, the cattle live a really long time and they don't eat them. And so they, have, they produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions over the course of their lifetime. So as we look at some of the research, it's trying to define how do we help our neighbors be more sustainable? Uh, how do we help China? How do we help India? How do we help Brazil not do deforestation in the, in the, and emit more carbon and to tear up the, the land and do land conversion? And so in the United States, we have some very efficient metrics, but I think we're continuing, Marie, to study, you know, what are the impacts and uh, how do they look and how can we make sure that we're counting the same things? That's what I've learned. We have another question over in the back. There we go. Okay. First off, great talks. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, someone recently shared with me an aha moment when I, they said, do you know how many gallons of water it takes to make a pair of jeans? And if you go on Google and you type that in, it says 1,800 gallons of water just to make one pair of jeans. Do you think our industry in food service is going to start to have barometers on looking at how many gallons of water is being used to make the food and beverages that we're buying? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I can say, at least in California, we're already doing that. We have lots of interesting conversations, uh, um, and it, actually a lot of it is around beef. So for a long time, UCSF was sourcing their beef um, internationally. Uh, USDA plants in South America, flash frozen, water shipped, the lowest environmental footprint on transportation, but part of that, and we're not alone, there's other places, at least in Northern California, that due to the water shortages in the state of California, one of the prime growing regions in the country, you know, we were thinking that it was the most sustainable thing we could do if to source our beef, it was grass-fed, grass-finished on top of all that, was to, to get it from a place that is not having a drought. And so I think that in certain parts of the country, it's really localized. So if, if water is not an issue where you live, 
then maybe it's not so much an issue. But um, at least in California, it's absolutely a consideration to things that, that we're doing. I think to kind of dovetail on that a little bit is, you know, when you look at water consumption in beef cattle, they're measuring the water that is used to uh, irrigate the crops that they eat. And so if they're not, if the cattle aren't eating those crops and you're going to replace that with a plant or you're going to replace that with something else, is it still going to require irrigation? Mm -hmm. The other thing is if you look at outside our window today, we have a uh, crown out there that isn't really good for too much to grow broccoli on it. But we can take beef cattle and we can put them on that they can convert those calories to something that's beneficial to you and me. So I do think that water consumption is a little bit confusing. That's something I had to learn about. And it's very much evolving. We've been since switched and we've gone back to a locally raised uh, beef product that we know is grown, raised, produced in California uh, and then doing it um, that way. So it's not to, we're not trying to demonize any particular uh, commodity. I think that uh, particularly Chris and I look at sort of, it's like an investment portfolio when it comes to protein. And it's a balanced in, in, in portfolio. And you, you tinker with it a little bit and you see, figure out what, what works. And then sometimes you're going to do a bit less of this and a little bit more of that. But the numbers in and of themselves, you know, pounds of beef doesn't mean a whole lot. It's really what type of beef product, what type of pork product, what type of poultry product, and then where are the recipes that are generating uh, that volume. So I'll stop there. We have a question in the back. So I actually have a two-pronged question. So the first one is, from a business partner perspective, what suggestions do you have to help that you can provide us direction on how we can help um, avoid overproduction, if there's anything from a product side that you've identified? And the second question I have is, do any of you offer, when we look at all the data that was shared, the biggest culprit, and I think we all know this, is um, vehicle emissions and us driving cars, right, from a carbon footprint, transportation from the supply chain through. Do any of you offer incentives f to your teams or within your organization to take cars off the road? I'm just curious about that. Overproduction first? Overproduction first. So great question how business partners can support that, right, because some of this is a lot, of, a lot of its behavior in the kitchen, which is just risk management, not wanting to run out, and so people make more than maybe we need, and there might not be a direct business partner in, uh, you know, interaction there. But I think some of it comes down to looking at value chain and looking at pack sizes and making sure that the products can be created at the right scale. And so, uh, you know, I recall an example once of one of our, our partners who was finding they had a lot of some vegetable product that they were throwing away and it was coming in frozen and it was in, I don't know, big bags. And they were, they didn't have storage for partial bags and so they were cooking it all even though their minimum need was, was lower. And so those kinds of things about making sure that the pack sizes are aligned with the actual uh, sort of uh, production uh, units, the batches that should be happening at smaller scale rather than very large scale. I think those are some areas to be helpful. and. Uh, just in general, talking to the operators around where they're seeing waste and, and which commodities, and then uh, if it's one of yours, looking at how you, you might be able to innovate with them. I, I would agree. I think the biggest thing that I, I found has been successful with us is communication with our partners. Um, I'm all about the relationship. We want to find ways to collaborate and work together with our partners so that if we need a change in it, then we can ask for that change. Um, I think that's one of the things that's improved is... Um, have an executive chef on my team. I feel like he does a tremendous job of being able to speak to the, the partner and say, hey, this is what I need. I know this is how you do it, but this is what I need and it's gonna work for us. And as long as the, the partners are willing to work with us, I think that's the key piece is just the communication piece of it. I think the smaller pack sizes on, on prepared products in particular are gonna be key. We didn't even talk about labor. And I don't know how your labor situations are. Um, I think all of us, at least the operators, it's, it's very much a common thread. And the question is just how bad is it um, based on where you're at? And in, in our area, we're, we're finding lots of uh, hard time finding qualified cooks, cooks that can really do and execute you know, our particular program. And I believe a lot of you guys are, are facing the same challenge. So having smaller uh, pack sizes on, say, prepared foods does in fact help. I think also m making sure that the, the operators are asking for, for that, particularly since so many of us are through uh, uh, GPOs. 
uh, that, to make sure that we're, we're, we're really working strongly with our, our business partners to say this is the types of things that we need. And we really have to start looking down the line. I mean, I'm, I'm looking about three years out and it's, it's gonna, my market's really tight. We've had the last culinary uh, program close up shop uh, in San Francisco, the, the, I'm sorry, the second to last one. The, the last one, we haven't had great success with their graduates, and then the only other one is CIA. Well, uh -huh. I love the CIA. Their graduates, at least their recent graduates, don't want to come work in healthcare most of the time. So it's, it's been sort of a challenge you know, for us to do that. The other part is cost of living. Uh, I know we probably have a little bit worse in California than, than perhaps others, but when you look at uh, union negotiations and labor costs and costs of everything, you know, going up, where are you getting those, those workers, you know, from? So getting them to your place is oftentimes very challenging. Uh, at UC, we do have a lot of pre-tax programs to answer Anne-Marie's second question, um, to, to incentivize them to do mass transit um, so they can buy their, their clipper cards pre-tax and do things like that. We also do van pools and we've developed some other um, strategic partnerships. Those work in the Bay Area. Um, they may not you know, be as necessary or available in other parts of the country. So um, I think they're sort of some of the best kept secrets that um, people have, but also there's sort of the culture of where you live and how do people get to and from work. Only about 20% of the people who work in my organization actually live in San Francisco. They commute a long way. And, and it's getting worse because the, the affordability of the housing is getting pushed further and further out, raising the commutes. I can't tell you how many people I've lost just in the last year, particularly dietitians who just don't want to do the commute uh, anymore, even with all the tax incentives and other things. It's just time is money and you want to have that work-life balance. Uh, so it's great to offer it, but you know, it it's may not be the, the silver bullet. Are there other questions? Here we go. Hello. Um, I just have, I'm just thinking a lot about what all of you have shared and said. Sorry, there's a lot of feedback. And um, what I'm wanting to think about and talk about is how do we take this information that you've provided, this framework and story that you've created about, you know, if not global, the national issue that we have with waste through our healthcare and food service systems as a part of that, and how can we look at it um, collectively, like with an organization like this, with executives and directors to um, really push a collective agenda forward. Because one thing I like that you said is that if we treated waste as a critical control point, like HACCP, that's something that's standardized throughout all of our operations. How can we think about how to incorporate this in a standardized way so that we can incorporate it um, into our cultures throughout our organizations collectively? Thank you. Anybody want to take that? Well, I love that vision and it's, um, I mean, change, broad-based change to how we do business is difficult. And, you know, the mission for our business is to make food waste prevention everyday practice in the world's kitchens. And we, we think that's going to keep us busy for a while because we, we know it's hard to change how people think about this. But I think it's a really inspiring thought to say, okay, what, what could we do through collective efforts? And, um, you know, one of those opportunities in this organization is, is excellent at this, is benchmarking and just understanding how you know, we can build common cause around something by sharing and being open about things that might otherwise maybe make us feel vulnerable, things we're not maybe doing as well as we want, but being willing to share that will create focus and movement. One of the reasons we wanted to, to do sustainability as this, this topic is we think that the timing uh, is, is right. And so I think a lot of those best practices, those standards, those tips actually already exist out there, how much they've penetrated into healthcare food service, that's sort of the, the million dollar question. Um, I, I think that there's an opportunity for AHF to come up with some tools and I'm certainly happy to help develop some of those in terms of what are the best practices for healthcare food service operators. And then seeing how business partners can help meet those standards. There are other you know, organizations in the non-commercial sector that have already done some of this. It's not rocket science, but it does give you a starting point. You know, so you know, if I want to start here, I can do this, and here's how we do it, and you, you layer that on with case studies. So I think the information is actually out there. It's just not packaged sufficiently for people to say, this is what I need, and this will help get me started on things. I offer the coffee cup as kind of an example of where to start. Just one little thing that has that triple bottom line, you know? If you can do a reusable cup program, if you know, can get through your local health authority, but if you're giving your, your, your people, you know, 
how, what would it take for them to use reusable cups? I can't tell you how many conversations my team and I have had about, well, what are the logistics of that? And how are they going to wash the cups? And is it going to go into their locker? And how are they going to get it back? And how are we going to know that the, and yes, you can see me getting frantic like this. Mm -hmm. This is how my team is uh, when we talk about these issues. Um, and you probably have some similar conversations on, on those kinds of issues. Um, so there's an opportunity there, and I think a challenge for, for us to, to be, be better as an association uh, by perhaps having some of those best practices codified for people. I think that's a really good point, and I appreciate that we're having the discussion because I do think that's part of the issue is, is looking at all the different, it's a very complicated mm -hmm. issue. It's not an easy one. If it was easy, we would have it fixed, <laughs> but it's very complex, and just having the forum to be able to discuss I think is fabulous. A question in the back? I uh, just wanted to share that our Wisconsin AHF group had a very interesting recent meeting held at a location in Hickston, Wisconsin, in the middle of nowhere, and, but it was held at Superior Fresh, and our picture is out in the hallway. Um, it's interesting, it's the world's largest aquaponics facility. Uh, and we got a grand tour, which is, um, was quite fascinating, but they produce uh, Atlantic salmon, and then the wastewater is then cleansed and sent to the leafy green section. Um, so it's a fairly new concept, I think, in the U.S., but this particular facility uh, shared with us that they are expanding on the East Coast and the West Coast eventually, so a new form of food production. And just curious if any had been working with those facilities before. Their products are available um, through uh, some of the food service distributing centers up in the Midwest. So their focus is 400 miles is the distance that they want to produce. And then they're suggesting they will build new facilities. So fascinating company to take a look at. Thank you. I know that working with particularly the broadliners in the room and getting better data, I think um, that they all have risen uh, to the occasion or continuing to strive to get better. And if you think about this, you know, how many different kinds of attributes, whether it's sustainability or CN approved or halal kosher, think of all the things that you could possibly tie to a food product. Uh, we recently did a little exercise and we came up with about 70. Now, granted, every single one of those certifications would not actually be tied to every single product. You know, uh, they're not going to do fair trade on everything, you know, for example. But you could probably think about that. And so I think the, the, the main part is communicating, you know, what do you want to know about the food that you purchase before you make the decision? I mean, so many of us are even just doing everything fully electronic and we don't even get a chance to look at the order guides because those are what are already set up for. So sometimes we always force ourselves to stop and say, what are the, the things that are most important? And are we going back to old school product specifications and saying, these are the things that we want in there and it includes price, quantity, yield, pack size, all those th types of things, but what are the attributes of that? And what makes it sustainable? Just because someone says it, someone, what, they, they do it, or do you want a third party? Uh, we're really conservative at UC, so we want the third party. Um, some farmers, some producers will say, that's not worth the money for us. I don't get that. I can go sell to restaurants and make there, and they'll take my word for it. And, and that's a challenge we have right now. Yeah, it is. Third party certifications, it's a culture change. And there's been production changes, just like some of the ones I showed you, that are because it's the right thing to do. And so farmers like to believe that they're those people that are doing the things for the right reasons. And so that, that layer of it's a, it's a complex system and food chain. And so to add some of those layers, it's going to increase food costs. And so there's that kind of trade-off balance, I think. But they're definitely willing to produce food any way the consumer wants it. And I think that's an important message is however it is that you want your food, the, produ the farmers can do it. It's just, I think, uh, having those conversations and making sure that if they do make that change, that then they have a market for it. Other questions in the audience? There's one over here, Kent. There's one in the back. One in the back, two. Go ahead, over there. Hi. Um, I love this conversation around sustainability, and I'm wondering, because I don't think we've touched on it quite yet, is what role do equipment efficiencies have in your decision making and how do you select your fryers and your ovens and your dishwashers and things like that? Does that, um, do you have criteria for that so that you're making sure you're being good stewards of the energy and the water? 
we're starting to look at that a little bit more. It was very interesting to hear uh, that, that Colorado is requiring uh, or will be requiring Energy Star uh, rated equipment where Energy Star is rated, not, it's not rated available for every type of food surface equipment. So we're looking very, very closely uh, at that as we're designing uh, new facilities or models or renovations. So that's very important to us. Uh, the other thing that we're taking a lot of a hard look at is metering. Um, I think that's sort of the, the, the nexus of, of really knowing how much our kitchens are actually consuming. And so particularly when you look at things like hoods, um, we're looking at for various variable speed hoods and how do you do that when you have all the air balance regulations uh, in healthcare. So we're spending a lot more time looking at it. I think that the challenge is not everybody's at a point where they're remodeling building or renovating uh, facilities, but it's important to us. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, UC San Diego, one of the things that we have is we're fortunate we have a, a great energy manager, and she's one of the ones that helps coordinate with our, per our uh, equipment buyers, and that's something they're looking at when we identify a piece of equipment that needs to be replaced, and they're looking at those energy ratings. Um, I think the challenge we have is you say this is the more expensive model. You have to have a story to tell them why in the long term it's going to be the cheaper model. Uh, if you include the energy cost of function mm -hmm. moving forward. And I think that's part of it. It comes back onto us, but we're trying to partner with our, our equipment buyers to make them understand how to sell that argument for a higher price, uh, typically a higher price piece of equipment. Life cycle cost analysis on your equipment would be very, very helpful to a lot of us. There's a question over here. Hi, Dan. Love what you're doing with the smarter menu planning to reduce the carbon footprint. I was wondering, do you have any uh, recommendations on software that can calculate the, the, the values of the food through, you know, smarter menu planning and reducing the carbon footprint? So there's no software um, just yet, although I, I will say, uh, depending on how you use the FOSS software system, the back of the house systems you do have, that's where the source of it all comes. Um, the information that, that Chris presented, actually all the University of California health systems are doing the cool food pledge. And there is going to be a free calculator uh, coming out, I think in a couple of months, uh, that'll be online through the World Resources Institute. So we'll let any of you uh, just sort of plug in your numbers and say, you know, this is how much beef I have and then convert that into uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the basis for that is actually science-based. Um, it actually turns things on its head a, a little bit, it has for us. You know, we've always focused on other things. And so we're again trying to have that, ba that balanced portfolio. Um, there is a group that is, you know, looking to say if you, the, the pledge itself, as Chris talked about, is reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from food purchases from 2015 to 2030. And that will be, um, again, the, the effort is going to be no cost. They're developing some toolkits and some other things. Um, I think the launch, as I said, in a couple of months, and I'll be sure to make sure it gets on the message boards and, and all that. I've got no skin in the game of it. Um, but it is turns things on its head a little bit. Their, their numbers would say, um, based on the life cycle cost analyses, they've looked at that transportation is only about 7% for most food products, and it's not nearly as high. While transportation overall is a massive contributor, a lot of that is air, air uh, travel and other things that we do personally as well as to support the food environment. So um, there is stuff, stuff coming that will be at, at basically low or no cost coming. Well, I mean, repeat the question for everybody else, Patty. Okay, the question was, uh, we talked about carbon footprint of equipment. How do we measure a farmer based on their carbon footprint? Do they know what their carbon footprint is? And again, I think you're right. It goes to different production models. Different production models have different carbon imprints. But uh, um, Andrew and I had this conversation. There's some very progressive producers out there that know their carbon footprint. There's the In the United States, probably if you ask that question, of the farmers that you, uh, in the world, in the United States, 7% of them could give you an answer, and one of them is related to Andrew. So <laughs> that's not a surprise. But most farmers would almost be offended with that question because they don't measure it. They, uh, they think that you should just believe them because they are really nice people and they have great stories, let me tell you. <laughs> but, but no, they don't measure it. And we know in the ag industry that's something consumers want, and we need to work with farmers to, to work with that. Uh, and to get those kinds of numbers for you. So there's some big numbers, but they aren't specific to that farm. So, and I'd like to go back to Marie's question. Um, when she asked about what kind of research is being done, I, I didn't think quick enough, but there's actually a lot of predictability studies being done right now where if we look at cattle, at least in the cattle livestock world, 
things being produced different ways and you know what is the efficiencies they put th they put in cattle they put a little chip in their cheek and they can measure like how how hard they chew they can measure what their rate of gain is so they can see how efficient they are so they so they have lots and lots of data but it isn't the kind of data that consumers want to hear and so we're trying to translate that into words that make sense for for you as operators Hi, Andy. This uh, question is kind of directed towards Andrew, and I needed some clarification on the PowerPoint that you said that the Earth, we, we needed a 1.75 Earth to feed the world? No. I was a little confused it's, by that. It's called Earth Overshoot Day, and it's a metric that's published every year, and it's the date at which we have used uh, the resources that the Earth can actually regenerate in one year. So what ends up happening is it means that we are, we are using 1.75 Earth's worth of resources in one year. So it means that we are over-extracting, we are relying on more than we're able to produce in a regenerative and sustainable way. And I can't give you all the science underneath it, but happy to point you to the resources on it. There's a ton of work behind it and it science-based, but it, effectively, it's just trying to put a face on the fact that we consume uh, in, an, in an unsustainable way. And, uh, and, and, and we need to be aware of that. And, and I think thinking of July 29th as every day beyond that, as a day that we're, we are living unsustainably, is pretty powerful. So I've heard that there, there isn't enough land to generate enough food for the world. Do you agree with that? Well, I think that's a complicated question, right? I mean, I think you've got uh, about 3.5 billion acres that are being used to create food that's wasted right now out of, I think, perhaps 8 billion acres that are in production. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of acreage in production. The question is, where is it? And if we're wasting a third of our food and we're trying to feed 10 billion people by 2050, um, it, it would stand to reason that we could waste less and feed more people with the foundations we have rather than expanding and converting land from rainforest into production. So uh, the question of do we have enough land, I think if we keep wasting at the level that we're wasting right now, no. Um, but, but, if, but if we control the level of waste that we have, we should be able to do a lot more with what we have. On the other side of this, though, you have a study out this morning, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN released today in Geneva looking at the whole question of the stability of our food system and the ability to feed our world. And you have on the other side expectations that with rising temperatures, we're going to have lower yields. And so even if we are wasting less, we may run into issues because of drought and other impacts that we're just not producing as much as we have been because we've had very efficient production from a yield point of view. That's, that's leveling and maybe dipping the other direction. So, um, but that's, yeah, I mean, lots of moving pieces. I think the other part of that conversation is what kind of food are you talking about? Do we have enough calories to feed everyone? Or do we have enough protein? Or do we have enough of a balanced diet to feed everyone? So I do believe that depending on what kind of, um, what kind of nutrition we're trying to get to makes a difference. Hi, I'm a federal employee, and I was struck by the comment of Chris giving food to the insecure students and also the food pantry. So sometimes we discover food either in the dry storage area or in the freezer. Accidentally, that's either it's closing to expire by or use by date, and in the freezer, most of the time, it's already expired. So you're telling us, are you telling us that we can divert this into the insecure students and the food pantry? Right, so one, one of the things that we have uh, is you have the ability, so the, the, what we call expired food to us in the hospital, it's expired because we're very tight on our parameters. So we're saying we're only gonna let it sit in the refrigerator for three days. Okay. That food is still edible. It just, we've decided that it's not something that we want to serve, so we're going to donate it off to another group. Um, the dry goods, we've been okay with donating to the food pantries. They'll accept it uh, and haven't had any problems with that. Uh, the food pantries are really, uh, it's very surprising how many uh, college students, well, living in San Diego, maybe it's not as surprising, but um, a lot of the college students, I want to say they were assuming about 27% of college students are food insecure. Mm which is pretty, you know, 
it's alarming to know that they're not doing that. It's so expensive to live there that they're, they're running without food. But uh, yeah, we've not had any problems with donating that type of food. And I don't know of any, there's no regulatory reasons. No, most of the Good Samaritan laws do, do protect you, but there are rules around what they will take. I think the other emerging industry we're seeing is, is food recovery services. Um, we are actually using one right now at UCSF where we actually, instead of the food sitting for uh, a day at, or more than a day, it actually sits in a precise uh, location in our, our freezer or refrigerators, I should say. It's weighed and measured, and then DoorDash actually comes and picks it up. Mm -hmm. So instead of DoorDash delivering the food, they actually bring, go get our leftovers, take them to the distribution center locally, and then they redistribute it to halfway houses and other um, charities that we have locally. So we don't even get to the point where we're, we're freezing uh, leftovers unless we know we have a, a good reuse uh, on this. But it, it is forcing us to look at that, but also getting the word out there. Now, to, to Andrew's point, we are, we're doing this because we think it's the right thing to do, but we aren't aggressively advertising uh, it because we don't wanna get into a scenario where people are overproducing to feed everyone else. We, we want to do it with the overproduction that we have for the right reason. So it's that, that tricky balance for that. But you do need to make sure that your, your regulatory entities, and that you've made the connections to the local food pantry. Some don't want perishable food at all, even if it's still good, even if it is frozen. Others will take it. It really depends on, on what you have. But there, there are these industries popping up. And you know, I think just to be really clear on that, no one's recommending that you are donating uh, food that is expired or unsafe or anything like that. I mean, I think this is all in the frame of excess edible food is the zone for looking at donation. There's a very specific set of conversations around short-coated food in retail where as you're getting close to a date, you may want to try to find an opportunity to get that to productive use. But um, yeah, I mean, th when we're talking about waste and we're talking about safety, clearly safety has to come, come first. But the food insecurity question is huge. And for those of us who work in academic systems, uh, I mean, it's the, you hear all of these stories about people making choices over eating versus books, eating versus rent. And it's probably more pronounced than ever before. And there's tons of research uh, on this. And so that's why you're seeing food pantries uh, pop up. We're seeing food pantries pop up in, in hospitals as well, um, though not as much as we're seeing on college and university campuses. And I think from a farmer standpoint, I'm gonna speak with my farmer's hat on, that's what makes this conversation very confusing and difficult, is because again, some of the things that you're, we're asking producers to do are making us less efficient. It's gonna cost more to raise crops. It's gonna cost more to raise the protein. And so again, it's just kind of a confusing discussion. You know, we have, we have starving people in the United States. We have, we have people that are happy with their food costs. They don't want their food costs to go up but yet it may increase our production costs. So that's what makes this really hard. Yeah. So another question over here? Uh, federal government again, taxpayers' money. Now, uh, for when you donate food, you're saying we cannot uh, donate almost expired tomorrow food to the pantry or whatever. Now, that's number one. Number two, are you saying we can freeze it? Or it doesn't matter because they don't have that kind of same standard. Now, when, how do you pass your local uh, hospital, medical center director or safety officers uh, to, to control the quality of the product you're giving to you know, local school or whoever, the receiver, and how often they come to get it? Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> what I would say is we, a couple things is we recently got into this. We really partner with the food pantries who are the professional people who, who know the most knowledge about it, and we coordinate through them. At our location, we had to run the process through our infection prevention team to make sure that they were accepting of our practices of doing it. We don't, we, once we produce food, we don't, I don't think we rarely, if ever, freeze it to be given away. The food is perishable, and it's just we will give it to the local food bank or the pa pantry to retrieve the food from us. And then they have the protocol. We, we know that they're going to show up with the, their coolers. They've, they have a time limit that they're supposed to go drop off the food to the pantries. But that's all coordinated through, uh, actually, our, our Lean Path people have helped us coordinate that with the local food pantry and uh, the, the food banks in our area. 
And depending on how close to expiration you are, you can actually send that out. I mean, the, these services, you're typically getting the food used within 24, maybe 36 hours from the point at which it leaves your facility. Um, so getting good supply chain, again, we blast chill it down, uh, don't freeze it like any other uh, food products. And so we know that it's safe from the point it leaves our facility until the point uh, it, it gets to the delivery driver. After that, we have to have some faith, but then it becomes their custody uh, for, for that particular food product. Other questions? Well, the last question I, I wanted to ask is, I, I think uh, in, in my experience, AHF and not particularly operators are very humble in what they're doing. And I think sometimes when you stop and tell the story, uh, what you can make that much more impactful. So I want to ask each of you as in closing, you know, what are the, the tips to telling your story better on any aspect of sustainability? Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Gosh, that's interesting. Um, right, because it is ultimately about stories, right? I mean, people remember stories. They connect with, with you emotionally. And so I think it starts with characters. You have to have people in stories. Stories that don't have a, a protagonist that's going through change uh, are less interesting. So if you look at story, it's got to have conflict and there's got to be change for a protagonist. So I think if you're telling a sustainability story, you generally have to start with a state that wasn't where you wanted it to be and a tension around that, a place you wanted to go and the people that did it. Um, two words, communicate and celebrate. I think that's the, the things that I've not done well is I, and that we're working on is communicate to the people we work with, communicate to the people I report to, communicate to the UC, communicate to this type of group, communicate the efforts that we're doing, and then also celebrate the accomplishments. Um, if you don't take the time to celebrate the accomplishments, they kind of get lost. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do right now is we're, I, I've asked my team uh, with our new sustainability officer, every time we do something that's sustainable, we try to take a picture. So that at the end of the year, when we have to do our practice green health award, I don't have to try to remember, what did I do back in June? I don't remember what we did in June, so now we have a running record of events. What did we do? What was the outcome? What was the promotion? And that'll help us continue to share the information with our organization and, and our community. I think the tip I would leave with is that you guys are the professionals in your organization for food. And so as people come to you with requests for we want this, we want our food produced this way, we want to know, our, uh, we want to know who's, where our food comes from, I think the tip I would give is just remember that the United States has the most safe, wholesome food supply in the world. And we can be very proud of that. And we also have tons of resources in this room. One of the things that AHF is so great about is that we've worked out problems before by work, pulling in our supply chain partners. You know, I had to go to work for a lot of them to learn how it all, all worked. And I hope you don't have to do that. Now I had to be a farmer, so I understood it better. But there are tons of resources in this room that can help you leverage your questions and help you get really credible answers. So please don't be shy about reaching out. So with that, uh, just a moment in closing. This is the first inaugural Fish Talk this year at Sustainability. Who knows what it'll be next year. I hope you've enjoyed this experiment, uh, the AHF conference, because we look forward to years from. Can we have a Janet Porter-esque round of applause for our panelists? <laughs> uh, thank you.